Yo, 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 what it do, what it be, it's your boy, A-N-T, repping the game, gang, you know we don't play none of that, all of that, and last time we was talking about uh, hip-hop history, I kind of also talked about my confusion with the Mount Rushmore debate and the qualifications for said monument, you know, because Mount Rushmore, like I said, isn't the four greatest Americans whoever lived it's the founding fathers or four of the founding fathers right so to me when people talk about mount rushmore's it's not a goat debate who's your four goats like that's you got top you could do top five top ten but like where people started to do this mount rushmore thing i don't know because again it don't make sense so to me we're going to be talking about my mount rushmore you know but it, you know it's more talking about the pioneers of hip hop and today you know like i was talking about the mount rushmore of female mc's now today we're going to be talking about to me three groups that should be on or that would be on my mount rushmore of hip hop right so i'm talking about none other than the beastie boys run dmc and Houdini and sure there are numerous other groups and crews but these three groups broke the mold in my opinion and their record sales reflect that and just their their uh, their stance in hip-hop history you know now one group that I'm not gonna talk about is the juice crew which I'm gonna discuss them in a separate video because they're more of a loose collection of rappers than an actual crew but I digress you know if anything uh, these three groups are like the holy trinity of hip-hop groups. And let me just clarify that to me, two people is not a group. Uh, EPMD, Eric B.M. Rakim, those are different. Those That's a duo. You feel me? That is not a group. A group is t uh, three or more. You know, that's a group. You could get into a solo or a duo act, but three or more, That's a that's a group. Backstreet Boys, you know, that's a that's a boy band group, you know, Outkast, that is a great hip hop duo, you know, just to kind of differentiate the two, in my opinion. Now, some people don't think like that. I had a whole debate with my homies, whole different kind of, uh, I, I digress again. The first group that formed out of the ones I mentioned, though, was the Beastie Boys, who formed in 1978, and they originally started as a hardcore punk rock group that consisted of michael diamond he would become mike d adam yak aka mca and adam ad rock horovitz uh john barry was the guitarist and katie schellenbach was on drums uh jeremy shatan was their bass guitarist i'm pretty sure i butchered his last name but you know he wasn't part of the the uh the rap group, the BC Boys, so does it really matter? No, I'm just playing. That's fucked up. But in 1982, the group released Polywog Stew, which was an eight-track EP and a single called Cookie Puss. Uh, kind of was their main breakout hit that was kind of like their best song. kind of paved the way for how they they would sound going kind of forward. Polywog Stew had more of an early New York hard rock sound. Uh, while Cookie Puss was more, you know, it had more hip hop sounding elements, but it was more of a comedic song than anything. It was kind of a, it was made based on like a prank call that that the guys had made or some shit like that. But Cookie Puss was m one of their more like popular songs. So around that time, they kind of started to switch their sound. So they started having a, uh, a NYU student by the name of Rick Rubin DJ for them. Around that same time, Ruben was starting to produce records, and he met fellow NYU student Russell Simmons, and they formed a label named Def Jam, which some of you may have heard of. I did a video on it. If you want to check it out, I'll leave a little link in like top right corner, however they do that. But by 1984, the Beastie Boys switched their sound to hip-hop and dropped John Barry and Katie, Sh uh, Katie Schellenbach and Jeremy Chatan from the group. And voila, the Beastie Boys as we know them today are born they dropped Def Jam's second single ever named Rock Hard that same year and never really looked back now uh, I believe it was uh, Ad Rock or one of the main group members actually said like he he kind of regrets getting rid of Shellenbach she was actually a really good drummer but I mean she didn't fit 
this you know bad boy persona or image that they were you know this you know rap star image they were going to be trying to portray so she just you know she she had to go now two years after they dropped polywog stew on november 15th 1986 the beastie boys would drop license to ill which i mean it would not only blend hip-hop and rock together but the beastie boys created this frat party atmosphere to their music i mean it was the first rap album to hit number one on billboards and i mean it's easy to see why paul revere no sleep till brooklyn brass monkey fight for your right license to ill the album had banger after banger on it son word to sheamus and drew mcintyre but after they got into money disputes with def jam they left for capitol records at the end of the 80s and they dropped their smash hit Sabotage in the 90s, which had, you know, they had more of an alternative kind of rock sound. But by then, artists like Eminem, bands like Rage Against the Machine, had they had gained inspiration from them, which would let you know just how influential BC Boys were, not just to hip-hop, but just to music in general. I mean, you got two of the biggest artists from two different genres uh, being influenced by this one group. Tragically, Adam Yock aka mca would pass away in 2012 uh but i mean the beastie boys his, i mean his music his influence in i mean hip-hop in both you know the rock genres they are i mean they're gonna live forever you know but r.i.p mca and shout out the beastie boys but while the beastie boys were becoming the greatest jewish hip-hop group of all time and blending the sounds of rock and rap Russell Simmons' younger brother Joseph and his two friends Daryl McDaniels and Jason Mazel would form a group with Jason, aka Jam Master J, as a DJ, Joseph, aka Rev Run, and Daryl, aka DMC, as the rappers. And they actually, uh, Russell Simmons named him Run DMC. And Russell came up with both Daryl's name and the Run DMC name because, I mean, the the delorean motor company was his favorite car brand dmc and they the group members actually didn't like the name but i mean lo and behold they stuck with it and it's one of the biggest names and brands in hip-hop you know but now run dmc dropped their first two singles under profile records it's like that and sucker mcs and they both were hits which gave them fuel to drop a full album and on that album is is a song called rock box which also blended rock and rap and it's actually the first song of that kind as run dmc's album dropped six months before license to ill did so i would also like to point out that rick rubin he gets a lot of credit for both beastie boys and run dmc integrating rock into their music and all that but larry smith should get just as much credit not only did he produce it's like that rock box he produced damn near all of the second album from run dmc and his friend eddie martinez was actually the guitar player for you know in rock box that's not even including all the shit larry smith produced for houdini but i'll get to that in a minute though larry smith should get way more fucking praise for his work on those two albums for real for real and it's not even a question i think rick rubin is kind of when when i was kind of researching stuff rick rubin a lot of his ideas he kind of stole them no cap they came from other people but i mean that's neither here nor there still great but i just think larry smith deserves some of the praise that uh uh rick rubin gets just being honest uh but Rick Rubin was the executive. Larry Smith was kind of just a producer. So, you know, hierarchy kind of shit. But either way, uh, their second album, Run DMC's second album, had hits like King of Rock, You Talk Too Much. Uh, and they dropped it, you know, kind of just a year after their debut. But the run wasn't going to stop there, no pun intended. I mean, they was they was about to influence, like, Wayne and Future, because like, they would drop their third album and this was actually produced by Russell and Rick Rubin. And when you talk about landmark albums in hip hop, this is one of them. Damn near every song is a classic. Peter Piper, It's Tricky, Raising Hell. All these songs still slap to this day. And I'm not even mentioning like the other unknown is, you know, It's Tricky, I think. But I didn't even mention Walk This Way. It, that revived Aerosmith's career and my Adidas, which led to one of the first and largest endorsement brand deals in hip-hop history as adidas paid the group 
Let me get this right. Adidas paid Run DMC one million six hundred thousand dollars to rock Adidas gear, and this was just the beginning of hip hop fashion becoming mainstream. And after Raising Hell, after that album dropped, they would go on the Raising Hell tour, which included the Beastie Boys, LL Cool J, and Houdini, which has been held as one of, if not the greatest tour of all time. Think about that. Oh, I mean, I guess the greatest hip hop tour, because, you know, you got the rock tours and shit, which, you know, some people may disagree on the genre, but the greatest hip hop tour of all time, which, I mean, I'd have to do more research on it and all that as far as the numbers go. But as far as the golden age of hip hop, it would be hard to find a better lineup than these four. And after the Raising Hell tour dropped, their next album, Tougher Than Leather, wasn't as critically acclaimed. We'll just keep it, you know, we'll just say that. And they didn't use the heavy rock and roll samples. Overall, everything after Raising Hell wasn't as revolutionary. And hip hop, you know, was reaching other coasts. The East Coast was shifting towards a more lyrical, gritty style uh, in the early 90s. And Run DMC kind of faded in popularity in the 90s. I mean, and then jam master jay passed away in 2002 of course after that the group was never the same i mean rev run followed in russell's footsteps and became kind of a hip-hop mogul starting several brands and having an mtv reality show before they started just you know kind of handing them out they still kind of were back then too but i mean to have your own show at the time not just be on an episode of mtv cribs kind of still a big deal at the time now daryl mack kind of took a different route he's admitted that he struggled with depression in the 90s uh just the stress of constantly being on the road touring traveling and uh he actually noticed that in 1997 his voice was giving out and he was diagnosed with uh, spasmatic dysphonia which was caused by his aggressive rap style and i mean his alcohol addiction kind of didn't make it any better but he wanted to change to, you know, kind of like a softer rap style. We got to use it, incorporate some R&B in they shit. And Rev Run was like, nah, bro, we fucking, we rock stars. We, we rap and rock stars, son. What you mean? I mean, he just wanted to keep up with that hard, aggressive style that, I mean, Run DMC was, was known for, you know? And, and I mean, he, it's hard, you know, you know, to switch up your style when you got fans that are like, oh, we're used to this, you know? So why the fuck is you rapping like that? You know, it's always changing your style is always hard because fans always want to hear one thing. You can't please everybody. Some of the fans are going to love it because they're like, oh, we love this new this new sound you're trying. You you know, you always got those people. Oh, I don't like this new artist sound. You know, I want the old artist back, you know, it goes around, happens all the time in hip hop. But. And I mean, just music in general, artists change their sound or try to do, you know, an experimental sound. And it's not, you know, some people like it. And for their core fans that, you know, are used to hearing one sound, it's not very well received for the most part. Sometimes it, they do cross over, but it's neither here nor there. These these differences that the, the DMC was having led to Daryl Mack only being on three songs on the Crown Royal album, which was the last album before Jam Master Jay's unfortunate murder, which has become one of many of hip hop's unsolved murders that you know I'll discuss in a future video. But DMC also dropped solo albums. Daryl Mack did. Daryl Mack dropped solo albums and has written an autobiography, self help books, and even written comic books. So he's really overcome some demons, and thank goodness he did because DMC, Rev Run, and the late great Jam Master J are pillars in the temple of hip hop, and the only group that churned out hits like Run DMC during their peak was Houdini, who I mentioned previously. They toured on the Raising Hell tour, and even though you know Houdini was formed after the Beastie Boys and Run DMC, their run and popularity rivaled both groups despite having a completely different sound. See, Houdini had more of like a funk kind of disco sound, yet as I mentioned before. Three out of six of their entire albums were produced by Larry Smith. Their first three albums are their best work. And their second album, Escape, is, again, you want to talk about landmark albums, 
is one of them. It's one of the greatest hip hop albums of all time, in my opinion. Uh, they formed in 1982. They got, uh, before I move on, they got some of the most sampled songs in hip hop history, just to let you know how influential they are. But they formed in 1982. And although John Carter, aka Ecstasy, and Jaleel Hutchins, and Drew Carter, aka Grandmaster D, were from Brooklyn, they weren't lifelong friends like Run DMC. Jaleel and Ecstasy were leaders of. Uh, rival MC groups from different projects and they eventually co uh, collaborated on a project and even recorded the first ever radio promo for Mr. Magic's Rap Attack and during this time Jaleel would become friends with Mr. Magic and through networking he would land a deal with Jive Records when he got the deal with Jive he ran to Ecstasy's house not, not just to tell him about the deal uh, but he brought in Ecstasy to record what would become Houdini's first album, which would be the the Haunted House of Rock, which, in my opinion, is like the equivalent of the Monster Mash. It's like the hip-hop version of the Monster Mash. And they also recorded Magic Swan, which is, I mean, that's dope as hell. You know, he didn't have to. He was the only one that got signed, but he, he kept his brother. He was like, nah, bro, I got this deal, bro. Help me come record this, bro. That's, shout out. That's some real shit. But, uh... They also recorded Magic's Wand, which would be Houdini's first big hit and also one of first uh, hip hop's like first big hits. So after their first album, they couldn't find a producer uh, for that second album. And it just so happened that Larry Smith needed some extra money to help a friend in the hospital. Kango Kid from UTFO put Houdini in contact with Larry Smith and soon after Larry Smith would fly out to Europe during one of Houdini's tours out there. And, I mean, he helped produce the second album. Their second album, Escape, would drop in 1984. And, oh, man, again, that landmark, this one of them, this one probably had the clubs going crazy when it dropped. No cap. Escape was a, just, it was just recorded in 16 days. Uh, it was recorded at Battery Studio in London and dropped on October 17th, 1984. And when you talk about hit after hit, five minutes of funk. Freaks come out at night. Big Mouth. Escape. Friends. Friends is one of the most sampled songs in hip-hop history. I mean... Tupac and Nas both have have hit songs to that hit song. You feel me? Like, how crazy is that? Their next album, though, Back in Black, you know, they dropped in uh, April 29th, 1986. Carried over some of that momentum with songs like One Love, Funky Beat, you know. They were, those were two of the best songs in the album, in my opinion. And after this album, a more, like I said, that hardcore, gritty, edgy sound would emerge in, in hip-hop from artists like Onyx, LL Cool J, guys like that. Houdini's style and image kind of became outdated, and they dropped their last project in 96, which was, I mean, it was mostly produced by Jermaine Dupri. It didn't, you know, drop really anything after that, which... In a crazy twist of fate, Jermaine Dupri was actually a backup dancer for the group when he was younger. Ain't that crazy? Uh, tragically, we lost John Ecstasy Flesher in 2020. And I'm sure him, Ad Rock, and Jam Master J are all up there in Thug's Mansion, as Pac would say. Raising hell with some brass monkey in the Adidas. You see what I did there? You feel me? You got to be spitting bars and all that. But for real, for real, RIP again to Jam Master J, MCA ecstasy and all three of their respective groups i mean they had a hand in building the foundations of what hip-hop is and has become and they are still influencing people today you know despite not being active artists for decades and let me just point out before i go who did he hung like their last project like i said is in 96 you hear a lot about artists trying to hang on and, you know, get, you know, that last project out or this is going to be my last album and then they drop two more just because they can't stay away. Houdini was like, nah, bro, we done. Like, our time has come. It's gone. We're just going to drop this last one and we're going to be out. Just like I'm about to be out. If y'all enjoyed this video, go ahead and leave a like. Leave a dislike. I don't know why you would dislike it. You don't, you know, like hip hop? No, but uh, the Hip Hop Anonymous? No, I'm just playing. But uh, go ahead and subscribe. Uh, if you like videos like this, turn on the notifications so you can stay tuned on all the hot content I got dropping soon. Follow me on Twitter, A-N-T underscore 303. You could also follow me on Twitch, A-N-T underscore G-G-E. Uh, yeah, it's me.
A N T repping the G A M E G A N G. That's the game gang. You know we don't play none of that, all of that. Y'all be safe. Don't get smoked. I'm out. Peace.